Được chưa? Ông Nguyễn Nguyễn Đạp Cảm Tô Cách 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 Nguyễn Nguyễn Đạp Cảm Tô Đoàn vị tình ca từ Đâm nàng xã Pri Nha Nông ca Phương sẽ đầy Chỉ lợi tốt Từ nâng sẽ đầy chìm tốt Lưu ai cả xã Sẽ đọc bỏ cổng Vì cả phía cái đầy Chỉ bằng tốt Nó xong chơi Mr. President, and good afternoon, Honours. Um, we will continue uh, our thematic responses to uh, defence objections. And just before we uh, just before we broke, um, I was uh, coming to uh, the con a conclusion of my discussion of uh, issues of relevance, uh, and of course we were uh, submitting. Your Honours, that uh, issues of uh, the scope of the joint criminal enterprise and the proof of widespread and systematic attack were very much um, part of this case and supported uh, the introduction of, of uh, a, a large number of uh, contextual documents that are in our first phase list. Now, and just before I leave this issue of relevance, um, my, my colleague has indicated earlier the legal test uh, for relevance. Um, there isn't a, a great degree of, of uh, difference here between us and, and the defence. Um, for example, as far as, of course, the legal test is concerned, uh, for example, at, uh, in document number E114, on the 6th of September 2011, uh, Ying Sari's uh, defence team submitted a general test of relevance, uh, which appears to be, uh, in, in general terms, again, consistent with our understanding of the law, which is that um, relevance is defined as evidence that tends to prove or disprove a material issue. In other words, it is relevant if its effect is to make more or less, more or less probable the existence of any fact that is an issue. Uh, of course, the submissions we made earlier, before the break, uh, are that the existence of the joint criminal enterprise uh, on the territory of Cambodia from 1975 to 1979, encompassing the five uh, policies I referred to earlier. Uh, is a part of is a matter of issue, uh, as is the widespread the existence of a widespread and systematic attack um, another matter which of course the defense are contesting in this trial so it is our submission uh, in conclusion on the issue of relevance that Evidence must be relevant if it tends to support the facts that establish the existence of those five policies uh, and of the joint criminal enterprise, uh, the overarching joint criminal enterprise. We don't want to enter the issue of um, motives on the part of the defence, but I do think there is a, a, an attempt to restrict the scope of issues examined in this trial that is at odds with what your honours have ordered, and it is at odds with the severance order. And, and with your own approach to structuring uh, these, these uh, trials, all of which form part of case two, uh, I, I will state that we think uh, repeated reference to a, quote, mini-trial are inappropriate. They're entirely out of place in a court that is dealing with crimes or alleged crimes that affected literally millions. People. Uh, we, we, we would implore our colleagues on the other side to refrain from, from uh, the use of such labels. They're offensive to the victims and they're simply uh, not reflective of both the scope and the complexity of this case. 
I will move on to the uh, issue of originals uh, very, very briefly. Uh, as my colleague indicated, Your Honours have, of course, ruled that there is no requirement for originals to be produced as uh, a prerequisite to admission, but of course, uh, in Your Honours uh, ruling, there is a preference given to originals. Um, and my colleague also uh, drew attention to a number of documents on the case file which evidence uh, extensive uh, work done by the co-investigating judges to identify, locate and scan original documents. Uh, I will be showing you uh, some of these relevant records uh, in the latter part of my, my submissions. Um, I'll just, for the sake of the, the, the com completeness of the record, state uh, the D numbers of the rogatory letters. Uh, that are immediately relevant to this issue. They are D161, D161, and that relates to the collection of documents at the National Archives. Secondly, uh, three documents which relate to the collection of documents at DC CAM and at the Tulsleng Museum. Those numbers are D248, D82 and D159. And of course, Your Honours, when one looks at these documents, uh, one must also look at the documents that follow. Uh, each of those series of uh, each of those numbers is followed by a series of filings which indicate how documents were obtained, uh, whether originals were viewed, uh, scanned, and, and how they were those scans were uh, brought and made available to the, on the case file. I will deal next with uh, another uh, thematic uh, objection, if I can call it that, uh, which I think we've heard from each of the three teams and which relates to the uh, supposed test of acts and conduct of the accused. Um, my colleagues on the other side are correct in one respect only, and that is that the test that hinges on the acts and conduct uh, of the accused applies only to the admission of written witness statements in lieu of oral testimony. And that has been the subject of extensive uh, filings, uh, which are in E96 and following. Uh, the case law that we referred to in those in those, uh, in our request, E96 and the filings that follow, clearly indicate, clearly indicates that uh, the, the case law of the international tribunal developed around the issue of admission of, of witness statements. And I will take your honours uh, quickly uh, to a couple of decisions of the, of the ICTY appeals chamber uh, to illustrate to illustrate my point, and I think one decision of the ICTR. Uh, the, the phrase acts and conduct of the accused is found in Rule 92 bis uh, of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence of the ICTY, as I'm sure you're all well aware. Um, and it relates to the types of evidence, types of testimonial evidence which can be admitted by way of witness statements or transcripts. And essentially what, the, what was uh, the position of the ICTY is that similar to this tribunal, there is a general rule that all evidence is admissible provided that it has uh, basic indicia of reliability. Um, and there were attempts to, to uh, admit into evidence uh, at times witness statements um, taken by a party to the proceedings. 
uh, at the ICTY, of course, the, the, the tribunal employs an adversarial model where the, the evidence is collected by the parties. So there were attempts to file evidence in the form of witness statements uh, collected by the parties, and it was uh, in recognition that such of the fact that such witness statements are uh, potentially lacking in reliability, uh, that Rule 92 this was introduced. Uh, it was introduced to allow a narrow scope or narrowing of the scope for the admission of, of witness statements, but it was never intended, nor does it apply to other types of evidence. Um, and I'll just quote briefly from the decision of the ICTY Appeals Chamber in Prosecutor and Galich, that's G-A-L-I-C. This was a decision of the 7th of June 2002. It dealt with this issue of admission of witness statements um, and, and essentially the, the court ruled paragraph 31, that Rule 92 bis is the lex specialis which takes the admissibility of written statements of prospective witnesses and transcripts out of the scope of the lex generalis of Rule 89C. And that lex generalis in 89C is similar to what we have in Rule 87.1. So it was, an, it was a, a provision designed specifically to deal with witness statements. And so one might say, well, what is a witness statement? And I think our friends on the other side have submitted that a number of uh, documents should actually be treated as witness statements because they record statements of individuals and therefore, as such, uh, they are in the same nature of evidence as a witness statement. Um, we say that that is not the correct approach. Uh, witness, the, de the definition of the term witness statement has itself been the subject of a number of decisions at the international level, uh, and it's fair to say there isn't a uniform uh, definition. But one thing is clear, that witness statement doesn't mean any document containing the words of, an, of a person. Um, and, and I'll give you, uh, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, in Prosecutor and Blaskic, this is B for Bob, L-A-S-K-I-C, a decision of the 26th of September 2000, the ICTY Appeals Chamber Ruled. looking at the meaning of, of a witness statement, a paragraph 15, quote, the usual meaning of a witness statement in trial proceedings is an account of a person's knowledge of a crime which is, a, which is recorded through due procedure in the course of an investigation into the crime. That is, Your Honours, the idea of a witness statement is restricted uh, in international jurisprudence to uh, statements taken for the purposes of investigating a crime. It is those types of statements that are subject to the acts and conduct test, not any other type of written material uh, such as books or, or, or uh, analytical reports. Um, and that this reasoning uh, the, the core of this reasoning is followed by the ICTR, uh, the trial chamber decision of the 18th of September 2001, uh, and this is in the case of Prosecutor and Niramashukuko, and I apologize if my pronunciation is, is uh, sloppy. This was a decision of the 18th of September 2001 at paragraph 9. The trial chamber was considering again the meaning of the term witness statement, and they say it means statements made during the course of judicial proceedings by prosecution witnesses expected to testify at trial, regardless of the origin of the said judicial proceedings. The point being made simply is that um, the rules that prevent written material coming in if it relates to acts and conduct of the accused, relate only to witness statements, statements taken for the purposes of the criminal proceedings and taken in an official capacity. 
Now, of course, Your Honours, there are numerous secondary materials that deal with acts and conduct of the accused. They include uh, contemporaneous uh, democratic Kampuchea documents, they include international uh, newspaper coverage of the events, they include books and analytical reports numerous other documents. Um, and what we say is that even where those documents touch upon the acts and conduct of an accused, it is perfectly acceptable for them to be admitted without calling each and every author or of each and every document to testify before your honours. The position, as we have already stated in, in, in our written pleadings, is different when it comes to witness statements. Now, why do we make this position? Why do we make this submission? Well, simply because we're not putting the books and analytical reports forward to ask your honours to accept what's written in them as proof beyond a reasonable doubt of those facts. We're putting them in to assist in the examination of historical, policy, contextual aspects of the case. We're putting them in as corroborative of direct evidence from witnesses and contemporaneous documents. Uh, and of, as my colleague submitted earlier, with a professional uh, trier of fact, with a trial chamber comprised of professional judges, it is perfectly acceptable to admit such secondary material because your honours are perfectly capable of sifting through it and, and giving it appropriate weight. Um, and, and I would just note in passing that my friend, uh, counsel for Ying Sari, alluded in passing yesterday that these types of documents, I think, he, to be fair, I think he was talking about, uh, about uh, reports, media reports perhaps, um, that where there, are, where there is a certain corroboration between a number of documents where they seem to confirm the same type of fact or discuss the same event, but that in itself lends them uh, indicia of reliability. And of course we agree with that submission. That, that's the, that has been a theme that we have put before your honours uh, throughout these hearings, that you have to look at these documents as a whole and you have to look at uh, the ways in which they corroborate each other and the ways in which they corroborate witness testimony. There is no harm, there is absolutely no prejudice in them being before your honours uh, because your honours are perfectly capable of giving them the appropriate ways. I will come back to the, to the issue of, of books um, uh, briefly, more, uh, because that is one of the annexes that I'm, I'm dealing with. Um, but I'll leave it, uh, leave it uh, for now, and I will just briefly also uh, recall in passing uh, on a related issue of calling witnesses with knowledge of documents uh, to authenticate uh, the documents that your honours have of course now ruled uh, at paragraph 7 of your decision E162 that there is no procedural requirement before this court to call witnesses with personal knowledge to authenticate documents. You indicated also that testimony as to chain of custody and provenance of course assists in assessing the weight to be attributed to documents. Um, and, and before I leave that point as to witnesses who can uh, give uh, testimony as to uh, the, the provenance and, and, and circumstances in which documents are created. Of course, the next, next segment uh, has numerous witnesses whom your honours have uh, summoned who will, of course, provide exactly that, that type of evidence. And uh, I'm looking at a list here. Uh, of course, we, we start with, with, with Dutch, but, but then following his testimony, a series of communication witnesses uh, and then of course Ministry of Foreign Affairs witnesses, commerce, propaganda and political education and administrative structure witnesses. All of these witnesses will assist in be our, our better understanding of the documents that uh, are before your honours.
I will deal briefly with the issue of confessions, simply because it's, uh, it has arisen a number of times in connection with, with different um, with different annexes, and, and, and what I'm referring to here is, is the, uh, the the prohibition in, in the Convention Against Torture uh, in Article 15. Um, and I think our learned friend counsel for Nguyen Chia made reference to rulings uh, of the trial chamber in case one. Uh, and those rulings are, of course, on the record. Uh, what I wanted to indicate is that what was read yesterday is not a full uh, account, if you like, of, of that particular issue uh, as it came up before the trial chamber. Your Honours made a, uh, a general uh, ruling uh, which was read, but then following that uh, general ruling, the prosecution uh, essentially submitted that, that our understanding was that um, a, a comprehensive decision on the issue of, of the CAT prohibition would, would only be made um, if, and, if and when a party seeks to rely on the content of the confession, uh, and that it would only then the issue would only then be ventilated in full. Um, we indicated that, of course, it's a very complex issue uh, and that we submitted that it needed to be dealt with comprehensively if, if, if rulings on principle were to be made. Um, and it, it was, I believe, Judge Cartwright who then indicated that the chamber reserved to the parties the right to make further submissions. Um, our, in terms of the, the, the procedure, our uh, basic proposal is that the way to proceed is, is, is by dealing with documents as and if they are uh, raised in court and, and ruling on, on the appropriate uses. Um, you will you will hear from uh, from one of my colleagues in, in far more detail on, on the acceptable uses of this material. There are, of course, acceptable uses of this material. Uh, there is no such legal test. There is no legal test um, that, that states that torture-tainted evidence is excluded. There is a two-pronged test that must be applied. First, a statement has to be shown to have been obtained under torture, and secondly, the use of that statement uh, or confession must itself be prohibited. Unless those two conditions are fulfilled, there is absolutely no prohibition on admitting confessions. And of course, there are numerous, numerous uh, proper, entirely proper and legitimate uses of that material, um, which my colleagues will expand on uh, in greater detail. Moving on to um, another point uh, which has to do with new documents. I think uh, counsel for Kusan Pan uh, submitted that um, their understanding was that new documents uh, identified in Annex 21 of the co-prosecutor's list are not uh, the subject of these, of these hearings, um, I believe they're, in, they're, they're incorrect on this. Um, these are not new documents submitted after the opening of the trial. They're simply documents that we submitted uh, back in April 2011 uh, in response to Your Honours. Uh, scheduling orders. Those, those documents are documents which at that time were not on the case file um, and they were proposed by us. They're very much uh, included in these proceedings. Uh, as counsel indicated, they are scattered throughout the 20 annexes and they're of course also separately identified in Annex 21. Uh, Annex 21 is simply a, 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 a listing for convenience of all documents that were, that were pro pro proposed as new at that time. I make this point because uh, the label new no longer applies to these documents. Uh, it is only once, once a trial 
commences with the initial hearing, uh, it is after that point in time the Rule 87.4 provides uh, specific restrictions on the admission of new material. It is once the trial has opened, and our submission is that all of those documents uh, that are identified as new in our, in our Rule 80 lists and in our first phase list, um, that rule does not apply. Those documents have been uh, put before your honours and the parties uh, that were put before you a while ago. They are the subject of these hearings and, and we invite the Chamber to, to, uh, to consider them admitted as, as, as all of the other documents that are in the annexes. Moving on to another issue, um, and uh, this is to do with considerations or allegations of bias of DC CAN. And we've heard this a number of times uh, over, the last, uh, over the last month or so. But on this occasion, the submission was only made by the QSAMPAN team. And I note that Nguyen and Chia team uh, have seemed to have given up uh, on that particular uh, front, which we say is futile. Um, Your Honours, I, I don't want to uh, spend an enormous amount of time on this point. I think it is self-evident that the position of DC CAM, their mandate, their commitment perhaps to seeing uh, accountability uh, and, and, um, and, and a recording of history uh, ultimately are irrelevant for the purposes of admissibility of the documents that were collected at DC CAM. It was not DC CAM's role to investigate the crimes. The crimes were investigated by an independent and impartial judicial authority. And what is important to recall uh, and I believe we all remember the testimony of Mr. Yuk Chang when he indicated that DC CAM's doors are open to all parties. In fact, DC CAM has been approached by just about all, all of the participants in these proceedings at one time or another to provide, uh, to provide documents. Um, anyone is free to consult DC CAM's archives. Um, what's more, this particular uh, position was endorsed by the co-investigating judges um, in two documents to which I will refer briefly. And they are A110 slash Roman 2, A110 slash Roman 2, and D164 slash 2. Uh, what these documents make clear particularly the second document, is that parties are entirely free to uh, visit any public library, consult any public source, and propose uh, any document which they consider relevant to ascertaining the truth. No one was excluded from DC camp. None of the parties were excluded from going there and, and uh, searching for documents. Um, in fact, none of the parties were excluded or prohibited from consulting any public source. And so we say that it is not appropriate for the defence to turn around at this stage of the proceedings and allege that because uh, DC CAM has an has a interest in recording the history and in seeing accountability for the crimes, that for that reason anything collected from DC CAM must be tainted and, and unreliable. That, that submission must surely fail. I will now move on to deal uh, with three uh, annexes, and I will do so briefly uh, because the defence submissions or objections were not particularly extensive on these, on these particular annexes. And firstly, Your Honours, Annex 7 which contains commerce records. Um, on this annex, uh, I, I recall that uh, the Nguyen Chia team 
accepted, in fact, encouraged their admission. Uh, I believe the Yingsari team left it to the trial chambers discretion uh, as to whether or not these documents should be admitted. And it was really only the Kusan Khan team that objected uh, to these documents being admitted. Uh, they did so on uh, a number of grounds. One of them was uh, the involvement of DC CAM, which uh, we just dealt with. Um, another complaint about these documents was the, uh, was the issue of, uh, of, of chain of custody. And there was also reference to the annotations which appear on these documents. Now, I, I will just recall again that your honours have ruled that evidence as to chain of custody is not a condition precedent for the admission of materials. All that needs to be shown is that they are prima facie reliable and authentic. Uh, your honours, in our submission, there is absolutely no doubt that these, are, these documents are both reliable and authentic. Uh, and we say so because um, there is extensive evidence on the case file as to the provenance and origin of these documents. Uh, Kisampan's counsel referred to the uh, statements of witness TC W5. Eight three, who was actually shown a number of these documents uh, during the judicial investigation and was able to discuss them. He is on your honours trial list and he will be uh, available, uh, we believe, to further expand on the circumstances in which these documents were created and just what they mean. Um, I, I wanted to use this annex to also illustrate the point we were making earlier about the attempts of the co-investigating judges to um, to obtain uh, originals. And Mr. President, if I have your permission, um, I would like to briefly display um, two or three documents that record, um, that relate to the commerce records and to the way in which they were, they were collected. So if I have, if I have uh, permission, I will, I will proceed. Thank you, Your Honour. Um, if we could show on the screen document D161, D161, uh, we made reference to this a little bit earlier. And Your Honour, D161 is a rogatory letter uh, issued by the co-investigating judges. Um, I, I do apologise for showing the English version here. Uh, it's just a little bit easier for me to follow what's on the screen. Um, if we can scroll down to the next, to the second page of this document, and what we have done, Your Honours, is we have redacted the names of the investigators uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but, of course, the full uh, document is available on the case file. Um, the highlighted section describes the mission which the co-investigating judges uh, were entrusting the investigators with, and it states they are to enter into contact with persons responsible for the National Archive um, in order to request their cooperation uh, for consultation and copying of documents, um, audiovisual archives, etc. Um, in the second paragraph, it says they are to consult such materials and/or request the provision of physical or electronic copies. Now, I would now like to move on to D161/1. That is D161/1. <coughs> this is to illustrate. Uh, my submissions earlier as to how att attempts uh, 
or, or work was, was done by the co-investigating judges in their office to um, obtain original documents or at least to consult the original documents wherever available. And you see here at, uh, on the first page in a highlighted passage uh, the investigators report that on two dates in 2009 they attended the National Archives of Cambodia and proceeded to consult and make colour scans of the original documents located within the archives. Um, 51 of those documents were scanned in their entirety. And when you scroll to the next page, it indicates that the, the annexes to this document um, are colour scans of the actual originals that are found at the archives. Um, on the point, I, I, I discuss, I'm discussing these documents now because, of course, the, the, the records collected at the National Archives are, by and large, the Commons records. So it is the Annex 7 material that is being referred to in these rogatory uh, letters and reports. Um, as to the origin of how these documents came to be uh, at the National Archive, um, Yuk Chang was able to provide some information in his statement D-150, D-150, where he indicates um, that the, uh, the, the, these particular documents were deposited at the archives by members of the Renaxe. Front. Just while we're on, on, on Annex 7, um, even though this point has not been um, addressed in, in, in great detail, I, I think it, it, it might just be useful if I, if I point out also um, the relevance of these documents. There are 169 documents in Annex 7, and on our review, it appears that 26 of them are reports to Brother Hem, who of course is Mr. Q. Sampan. In addition to these 26 reports, approximately 98 documents, uh, which are Ministry of Commerce documents, contain annotations that refer to Brother Hem. They're usually annotations that show that documents were sent for approval um, to uh, Mr. Q. Sampan. Uh, these documents are, of course, relevant um, for a number of uh, reasons, um, including the fact that they evidence um, the functioning of the regime and they also uh, evidence Mr. Q. Sampan's authority with respect to the Ministry of Commerce. And these are very much matters that are um, included in this, in this first, first trial. And I might um, I might at this stage also display another document, um, and this is D three six six slash seven dot one dot eight four one. What we will do is we'll display. This is another annex, uh, annex seven document. We'll display it um, in, in Khmer. Initially, um, just to show the documents uh, format in, in the original language. If, if we could show that document, D366.1.843. And, Your Honours, um, this document appears to be a ledger which records the, um, the uh, supplies or storage of paddy and rice for the month of March of 1977 um, indicates large amounts of produce being centralized in Phnom Penh and that produce uh, having uh, originating rather from uh, the southwest zone, the west zone, the east, the northwest <coughs> and rather and the northwest. We might just show that document in English also. Um, it may be of, of, of interest to the to those who are unable to read Khmer. Um, 
But this document is, is again, uh, it, it bears an annotation indicating that it was sent to, uh, to Mr. Kisampan, to Brother Hen, um, but it is also relevant, and, and you can see these uh, the relevant passages are marked in red on the screen in the top uh, left hand corner uh, shows that it was sent to Brother Ham. Um, it shows in our submission, among other things, um, the fact that the, that the central government was very much in charge of um, the, the collection and, and distribution of, um, of this type of produce. Um, the issue of annotations was also uh, raised, and I've indicated that a number of these documents contain annotations, I believe 98. Um, on that issue, it is our submission that these annotations um, basically are not relevant for the purposes of admissibility. Um, they, are, they appear to be annotations of Van Riff, the Democratic Commission Minister of Commerce. Um, I won't say more on that. It will be the subject of uh, <coughs> testimonies before your honours, other than to say uh, these, these, these are simple, uh, apparently, administrative annotations. Um, on their face, they appear to be uh, uh, to have been made in the course of business of the Ministry of, of Commerce. I see no, no way in which the, the presence of those annotations uh, detracts in any way from, from the admissibility of documents, particularly when you consider that what you have before you is essentially originals or scanned originals. Dealing with um, Annex 15, briefly, and this of course is the annex that contains a number of maps and photographs. <coughs> And we would note that the vast majority of these documents weren't actually objected to. Um, I, I, we kept notes over the last two days, and it appears that only a small number were specifically <coughs> identified by Council. Of course, ample time was given uh, to them. Uh, they all completed their submissions uh, in less than the time that was allocated. Um, no one here said that these documents uh, had varied relevance. Uh, the Yingsari team uh, commented on <coughs> photographs uh, stating that, or submitting that if they are purported to be fair and accurate representations of matters as they stood in 1975, uh, or, or images as they, as they were in 1975, and I believe the submission was that the witnesses had to be called to testify um, as to those uh, images. Uh, we say that that submission uh, is, is simply um, not legally correct. There's no such requirement. Um, there is a large number of photographs on the case file. <coughs> Many of them were taken after the 1979 period. Your honours are perfectly capable of looking at them. Um, and, uh, obviously, in light of also witness testimonies, um, giving them any weight that you consider appropriate, I should say that where there are pictures of buildings in Phnom Penh, uh, by and large, they're not intended to be uh, representative of buildings as they were in 1975 um, or 1979. These, uh, many of these pictures were taken by uh, investigators uh, in the presence of witnesses. They were simply taken in order to identify <coughs> relevant sites and witnesses. Um, uh, will be able to further describe uh, those sites as they were at the, at the relevant times. Um, we, we have limited time, so I, I, I don't necessarily propose to go through uh, each 
I think there were six documents that were raised by other council. Um, as the document uh, D108 slash 39 slash 8, if, if we could show that document on the screen briefly, simply because I think it's, it's been referred to by um, a number of Council. D108 uh, my learned friend Council for Ian Sari made extensive submissions on these documents. Um, I Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, that document should be coming up on the screen. Uh, briefly, my learned friend made uh, <coughs> detailed submissions on the program that produced this document. It is entitled Genocide Sites in Cambodia. Uh, Your Honours will recall that uh, my friend uh, made submissions uh, in relation to the use of the word genocide um, and also uh, to the um, methodology <coughs> adopted um, in creating these maps. Uh, these are maps uh, according to the introduction. <coughs> They're simply maps that are intended to uh, indicate the uh, geographic location of, of suspected uh, crime sites. They're not, they're not ultimately conclusive, obviously. They're not, uh, we're not putting them forward as, as evidence um, beyond a reasonable doubt of these sites, but they are, we, we submit, contextually relevant. Um, the, the introduction of this document explains how these, um, these sites were identified, um, and there's a number of sources of information, including witness interviews, uh, local informants, use of democratic compatriots, own documents, uh, and, and various reports. So this is a, uh, an analytical document that in our submission, um, does have the basic indicia of reliability. Uh, whether or not your honours ultimately agree with, its, uh, with, with the mapping or with the location of sites, uh, that is a matter for your honours. It is a matter to be decided following uh, the trial and, and following the, uh, all of the evidence that, that, that will be put before you. Um, we have no objection uh, if your honours consider it um, appropriate to call the, the authors, uh, we wouldn't object to them coming to testify um, if that is the defense's request. And, and here is that document now. It appears on the screen. Uh, and, and, and you can see um, that it simply indicates various uh, locations where there might be um, various locations that may, may contain crime sites, that is mass burial sites. Um, these types of documents we submit are relevant, again, because of the requirement to prove the widespread and systematic attack on the territory of Cambodia as a whole. They are relevant also because of the need to prove the existence of a, uh, of a joint criminal enterprise to search for uh, and uh, kill enemies throughout the country. And the same applies to uh, some of the other documents that were, that were uh, challenged, um, specifically documents D108-19 slash 1 slash 5 and D108 slash 39 slash 10. Uh, again, these, these documents um, are maps of alleged uh, killing fields and they are, they are relevant and, and they, they do have prima facie reliability that is sufficient for them to be admitted before us. Moving on to um, Annex 19, and this Annex, of course, uh, contains books. I made submissions earlier as to the uh, admissibility of this 
of this type of material and the non-applicability of the acts and conduct uh, on the uh, acts and conduct test to this material. Um, I believe it was um, uh, submissions were made by Council for Ying Sari that authors, that for books to be admitted, the authors had to be called. Um, we, we submitted that is not uh, uh, the correct legal position. While your honours have uh, summoned a number of experts who authored several of these books, uh, our submission is that ultimately uh, hearing the authors is not uh, a, a prerequisite to, to admission because the documents, the books are being submitted as contextual and corroborative evidence and evidence that helps establish policy. <coughs> they are not uh, in, in most cases, they are not primary evidence of, of any uh, criminal activity as such. Um, and of course, Your Honours, when you look at the defence lists for uh, where they proposed uh, materials to be put before Your Honours, there are numerous, uh, numerous books that have been, uh, that have been proposed. And so I simply note that in passing, uh, because uh, obviously all parties see the relevance of books as material that can assist in contextualising some of the <coughs> evidence, some of the direct evidence that is being put before you. And the relevant, um, the relevant lists uh, for Ying Sari uh, is 109-6.2. This contains a number of uh, books which are proposed to be put before your honours. Um, the same applies to Kusan Pan, uh, and you can find a number of books and academic papers uh, listed in E9-29.2, <coughs> which was the original list from April 2011, as well as the first phase list, which is E109. Slash one point one. There is another list which um, we we believe, Your Honours, um, should should take into account when considering defence objections, and this is a list submitted by Ying Sari in April. Uh, as part of the initial uh, <coughs> list of evidence. And this is E9 slash 25.2. Now, this is quite a, quite a long document, some 100 pages. Uh, it contains over a 1,000 uh, documents that are proposed, new documents that are proposed to be put before your honours. It includes the full shopping list of documents that we've been discussing uh, these last two days, from newspapers to books and academic papers to analytical reports, foreign government materials, including CIA and the like, and of course, uh, contemporaneous democratic campaign. We haven't objected to any of this material. Uh, we feel uh, it is important that the defence uh, wish to put these documents before your honours, put them to witnesses uh, and make submissions on them. Uh, we, we obviously not object to consider it important for them to be able uh, to put their case. But we do also make the submission that, uh, or make the observation rather, that when Ying Sari submitted this rather lengthy uh, list of documents, he was not proposing at the same time to call their authors. Uh, and the reason, of course, that wasn't done is obvious. We, this trial would never complete if we were to call every author of every book of every analytical report that is proposed to be put into evidence. Um, I will close uh, by uh, just dealing with one document which uh, I believe most, if not all, of my learned friends made reference to. This is D2-15, uh, D2-15, 
Dash 15 Mình is an analytical report prepared by uh, Mr. Craig Etchison. Uh, Mr. Etchison, of course, testified before your honours in the first trial. Uh, your honours uh, considered his expertise uh, sufficient to uh, bring him in to testify on matters of structure. Of, uh, uh, democratic uh, of course, we support the defence's uh, request in this regard, uh, in part because this, is, uh, this gentleman is one of uh, the leading experts uh, on, on these issues in the world. He has been found reliable by your honours already. Uh, as my, my learned friend for Sari indicated, he is available. Uh, within the 100 metres of us, and uh, we have also proposed him as a witness, so we see no particular reason to object this, this testimony is, is, can be obtained without undue delay, uh, and we're happy for, uh, for the defence's request uh, to, be, uh, to be accepted. Um, Your Honours, that concludes my, uh, my submissions. Um, I am looking at the time. At this point, I would, uh, I would hand over to my colleagues uh, who will deal with annexes 14, 20, and 17. Um, but perhaps your honours may wish to take a break at this stage. ឧបាទសម្ព័ន្ធដល់ប្រាំពីរហើយខ្ញុំគិតថានៅពេលនេះប្រហែលជាអង្គចៃក្រមចង់ធ្វើការសម្រាក់ដោយសារតែយើង